Tonight we are turning to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through verse 15 for the passage that deals so plainly with the judgment of the wicked dead. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through verse 15. Eternal punishment is not a very pleasant subject. Just like cancer or crime or war, it is not pleasant, particularly to men, and I guess that we should add particularly to 20th century men, because human nature, and especially the manifestation of human nature in our day, does not like to think of the fact that it shall be called to account. As they said a long time ago to the prophet Isaiah, Prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things. And so the world likes to hear things that are smooth and things that are not right. They do not realize often that the things that they're asking for are things that are wrong, but they like to hear that God is a God of love and a God of mercy, but they do not like to hear that God is a God of justice and a God of righteousness. A number of years ago, Clarence Edward McCartney, in one of his sermons, said that in one of the Midwestern universities, a poll was taken of 100 selected ministers on the subject of future punishment. The result showed that more than 50% did not believe in the future conscious eternal punishment of the impenitent. Another poll, Mr. McCartney pointed out, was taken of 500 ministers of different Protestant churches. And that poll showed that 34% did not believe in the future punishment of the finally impenitent. Now I think if a poll were to be taken today, we would find that these percentages would be drastically decreased from these percentages that are mentioned in these polls. Jerome who was one of the greatest of the biblical students of his day. Jerome said, if an offense come out of the truth, better it is that the offense come than that the truth be concealed. The Apostle Paul said, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And so we are not expected when we become teachers of the word of God or even readers of the Bible to pass by those parts of the Bible that are unpleasant. Actually, the idea of hell has the same origin as the idea of heaven. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. The term that is used in the New Testament for hell, most specifically, is the term Gehenna. That term is found about 12 times in the New Testament. It always means hell. And with one exception, in James chapter 3 and verse 6, in every other instance, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who uses it. So that Gehenna is Jesus Christ's word for hell. Thus reminding us of the lines of the poet Keeble, the fount of love, his servant sins to tell love's deeds, himself reveals the sinner's hell. So the Lord Jesus himself is the one who has most fully revealed to us the existence of a hell and eternal punishment. Charles Wolfe was a preacher of great ability, and in a sermon from the text, Ecclesiastes 8.11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, Therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil, said in a very striking way that the judgments of God fall often enough in this world to let us know that there must be to let us know that God judges, but seldom enough to let us know that there must be a judgment hereafter. If you're reading the newspapers day by day and you see the crimes that are committed and are set forth in our newspapers crimes against children, crimes against women, crimes against the innocent, you cannot help but feel deep down within that not only is there a judgment, 
but it's going to be a great thing for judgment to come so that the wrongs committed in our society are going to be righted by the Lord God himself. Now in this passage that we're looking at, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through verse 15, we have the only final judgment. What a magnificent comprehension and condensation of truth is found in these simple verses. Let me read them beginning at verse 11, Revelation chapter 20. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now first I want you to notice the vision of the throne in verse 11. One might ask the question immediately now, when is the time of this judgment that is referred to here? And we have a clue in the opening three words of the English text of verse 11. And I saw. Now as you look back over the immediately preceding sections of the book of Revelation in chapters 19 and 20, this expression, and I saw, occurs about seven times. Actually, it occurs, occurs more than seven but it occurs at seven points which reveal progress in the visions that John is seeing. And these and I saws give us an idea of the chronology of these events of the last days. Now notice that verse 11 begins, and I saw. Now if you look at the immediately preceding context, in the fourth verse we read, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. At the conclusion of verse 6, the passage dealing with the millennium, we read, And when the thousand years are ended, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. We did not read any, And I saw. So the immediately preceding context introduced by the vision uh, nomenclature, And I saw, is followed here by, and I saw a great white throne. So we reason from this, and I think properly so, that we are talking about a judgment that is to occur at the end of the millennial kingdom upon the earth. So John has unfolded the facts of the millennium. He has unfolded the final rebellion that shall take place at the end of that kingdom of God upon the earth. And now he's given the great vision of the throne in verse 11. So we are, I think, encouraged to look to the events just preceding the eternal state, or the new heavens and the new earth. Now John says that he saw a great white throne. It seems to me that these are very meaningful words. First of all, it's not simply a throne, but a great throne. And the impression I get from it is that here we have the final expression of the justice of God. And since the person who sits upon it is an infinite being, it's not really stretching things to say that this word great, this adjective suggests infinite justice. The fact that it is a white throne also in keeping with the figurative or symbolic nature of the adjective white suggests that it is a throne at which holiness shall be supreme. So it is an infinite holy. Now throne itself suggests judgment or justice. So it appears to me that this combination of the two adjectives and the noun, great white throne, suggests infinite holy justice. Why is it necessary for there to be a great white throne judgment? 
Well, first of all, the great white throne is a vindication of the holiness of God. Remember the Old Testament said, as the prophet expressed it in Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. So God is a holy God, and it's at the great white throne judgment that there is the vindication of the holiness of God. There are a number of reasons why this is necessary. Someone has put it this way. There are four reasons why justice here is not final and perfect. Some people incidentally like to say justice here is not perfect, and so therefore we ought not to have any justice. We ought to let everybody go free because we cannot be just in our judgment. That is a deduction and an inference from the fact of human fallibility that is unjustified. But we do know that human justice is not final and perfect. One of the reasons why justice here is not final and perfect is that there are so many sins and sin transgressions in which the human law, of which the human law takes no cognizance. We don't have any laws against mental cruelty. We don't have any laws against ingratitude of children toward their parents or of wives or husbands to one another. We don't have any laws against scorn. We don't have any laws against falsehood, for that matter, in many cases. And so the very fact that our laws are imperfect in that respect, they don't cover all of human wrong, makes it necessary for there to be a final judgment. Furthermore, the human judges in our courts do not know what the, the exact penalty that fits the offense. Only in one case, so far as I can remember, and that of murder, do we know by the authority of the Bible what the penalty ought to be. And it's not surprising that that penalty is largely not carried out in our godless society. But the judgments that are less than the judgments that are designed for murder are not set forth in the word of God. So they are really just token penalties, the things that human beings mete out. Five years, ten years, twenty years for some crime is Hibernian. It's not divine. And as we shall point out in a moment, it is not just. The human judge also is often uncertain as to the guilt of the prisoner. He doesn't have sufficient evidence often to know whether there is really guilt. We've seen enough cases of individuals go to penitentiaries protesting their innocence. And then years later, after they've served in prison for a lengthy period of time, someone comes forward and acknowledges that they are the ones that are really guilty of the crime. So with the best of human justice, we cannot really know that a, a prisoner is guilty. Now these are the minor cases, these are the, certainly the ones that are not the normal cases. Most of the time the guilt is very obvious. That's why God gave judgment into human hands. But we cannot know fully and accurately in every case. And then also we need perfect justice hereafter because in this world the guilty often escape. They're not even brought to any kind of judgment at all, much less freed. It is true that justice stands blindfolded with the balances in her hand. But often justice down here is blindfolded and consequently men who are guilty are never brought before any bar of judgment. There is going to come a time when God is going to right all of the wrongs and even those crimes that are not spoken of in our laws. They also are going to be dealt with at the great white throne judgment. I know that there are people who do not even like the idea of judgment. But nevertheless, that is a biblical revelation. In fact, the idea of God punishing someone eternally is something that is very displeasing to people today and very unpleasant to preachers. The great mass of the preachers in our professing Christian churches today are turning to universalism, the belief that ultimately everybody is going to be saved. You can just imagine the reasons that lie behind that. A God of love would never send anybody to an eternal punishment. 
The idea of a crime committed in time being punished by an eternity of punishment, well, that is very illogical. And so ultimately, everybody is going to get to heaven. I can just imagine, as one Bible teacher said many years ago, two angels talking together before the creation of the world. Uh, they learned the secret that God was going to create a world and he was going to bring a universe into existence that would have rational spirits. And they would also have bodies. One says to the other one, have you heard that God's going to create a world? And the other angel said, yes. That he's going to have moral and intellectual beings in that world, yes. Not purely spiritual beings like ourselves, but beings with material bodies. And yet with minds and wills, just as we angels have minds and wills of our own. Yes, I've heard that's his purpose. But can you answer this question? Do you think that our God will ever permit unhappiness to come into the world that he's going to create? Oh, certainly he will not, the other one would say. Our kind, loving God will never permit unhappiness to come into a world that he's about to create. Well, you can just go right down the line of the things that uh, they might have said. Do you think he'll ever permit sin? Do you think he'll permit men to suffer pain and anguish? Do you think he will permit men to, be, to suffer from the hands of, of wicked people when they themselves are innocent? Well, we can argue as much as we like and we can reason and uh, rationalize about it, but in the final analysis... We know that he has permitted these things to come to pass. And they tell us what our God is really like. He does permit sin. He does permit wickedness. He does permit injustice. And those things are designed ultimately to reveal the kind of person he is. He is a just God and he's a loving God. And he does punish sin. Well then, uh, one of the reasons for the great white throne judgment is the vindication of the holiness of God. Another thing is the revelation of the goodness of God. The ruin of the few may lead to the salvation of many. It's good even for us to suffer for sin. We learn the plight that we are in. A Connecticut preacher once said, My friend, some believe that all will be saved, but we hope for better things. Chaff and wheat are not to be together always. One goes to the garner and the other goes to the furnace. And then, of course, uh, the great white throne judgment is a necessary thing because it makes very plain the consummation of the sinfulness of man. The facts of our human existence are that when we commit acts of sin, our acts of sin leads to, lead to habits of sin, and our habits of sin form our character. Isn't it strange, and yet it's not strange when you think about it, that the Bible says that when Judas died, he went to his own place. It was the place for which Judas was suited by his character and also by his acts. We don't realize that the things that we do are things that really affect us and ultimately make us what we are. In the final analysis, we will reveal what we are by the acts that we perform. There's an Old Testament king who illustrates this, I think, and he's Hazael, the king of Syria. Before Hazael became king, Elisha said unto him, I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with the sword, and will dash their children and rip up their women with child. Do you know what Hazael said? He said, Is thy servant a dog that he should do this great thing? Yet he was led by the insidious subtle and progressive nature of sin to commit the barbarities which the prophet predicted, which he viewed at one time with the greatest of horror. But the products of our actions form our character ultimately, so that those who go to hell will go to their own place. In fact, if somehow or other things got mixed up, and they were put on the wrong train and arrived in the new heavens and the new earth. That's the last place they would want to be. 
They want to be with their own. Peter was in earnest when he said to the Lord Jesus, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. But you can see the progressive nature of sin even in Peter the believer. In a moment, he's following Christ afar off. He's found then in bad company. He hears blaspheming and denying, and soon this fellow too is denying the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the difference between a saint and a sinner is that Peter went out and wept bitterly. But the path of sin is a progressive thing. And the great white throne judgment will reveal the consummation of man's sinfulness. Now we read here, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Well, I don't know where this great white throne is going to be set. It's going to be set somewhere in the illimitable space of God, but it's going to be set. No place is found for the earth and the heavens, and there is no one there but the Lord God himself. Now John in verses 12 and 13 has the vision of the judgment of the dead. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Now to whom does he refer when he says he saw the dead? Well, if you look back at verses 4 and 5 of this chapter, we read, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So here are individuals who lived. But in verse 5 he speaks of the rest of the dead. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. So we have here a description of individuals who are living, and then those that are dead. And a thousand years separates the resurrection of the living, that is the believing dead, and the dead who don't live until afterwards. Now the word live is a reference to bodily resurrection, so that there is a bodily resurrection for the believers before the millennium, and then there is a bodily resurrection for the unbelievers afterwards. But oh, what a different kind of body they receive. Believers, we are told in other places, receive a body like our Lord's own body of glory. But the unbelievers, they're going to be resurrected too. There is a resurrection for them. But they will be given a body in which they are able to suffer eternal punishment. And it is entirely different from the body of glory that the saints receive. Now these are the ones that John sees in verse 12. The unbelieving dead. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God. These are the physically and spiritually dead. Not simply the physically dead. Spiritually living as is referred to in verses 5 and 6. Among this company, there are some well-known individuals. We know some of them. We know their names. Cain, he's one of them. Noah's generation. Nimrod. Pharaoh. Saul, probably. Judas. Pope Leo X. Harry Emerson Fosdick. And many others. Some who are living right now, it would seem, are going to be part of this company of the dead. Those who deny the truth of the word of God. Now when the dead stand before the throne of God, there is nothing there for them, according to this passage. Some years ago I went into a dentist's office over in Lakewood. That itself wasn't pleasant, and I should have known that what I would read in the book there would not be pleasant either. But I opened up a book entitled, uh, it was really a periodical as I remember, called The New Age. And it was a publication of the Masonic Lodge. And evidently the doctor was doing a little 
uh, propagandizing of his patients, preparing them for even worse things, I suppose, when they sat in his chair. It's been many years ago, but I ask for permission to clip out a page in that book, and I have it here before me. And it was a foolish article. It was entitled, The Temple Not Made With Hands, and has no theology that's any good at all in it. But this particular paragraph was interesting because it was such a flat denial of the truth of the Bible. The Holy Bible is given us as a rule and guide to faith and life. Within its covers, we find a set of rules and principles, if followed, will make our lives pure and spotless. We will enjoy an honorable life. There is salvation by good works, you see. And when our weary feet shall have come to the end of their toilsome journey, and from our nerveless grasp shall drop forever the working tools of life, and our bodies have been laid beneath the silent clods of the valley, we can look forward, if we have been found faithful, to a triumphal entrance before the great white throne, there to stand before him who sitteth as the judge supreme, and hear from him the welcome words, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Yes, he said, into the temple not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What do men imagine, rather than studying Holy Scripture? This is not an experience that is wonderful and blessed. When John says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, he is telling us of one of the most awe-inspiring and one of the most terrible scenes in all of human history. Now notice he says the dead, small and great. Kings and peasants are there. Preachers and atheists are there. In other words, all kinds of people, they all, small and great, shall be there before God. And he sees them stand before God. That confirms the idea of resurrection involved in the fact that the dead are there and they did not live until after the thousand-year kingdom. So they stand before God. It's going to be really a terrible sight. Then the manifestation of sin, which began as they were born because we are born in sin, lived in them on to its ultimate manifestation in this life, will reach its final, final state there before the Lord God. I would imagine there will not be a handsome or a beautiful face in that entire lot. They will be the most gruesome-looking people that you could possibly imagine. I read a story uh, some time ago. It was told by one of the older preachers about a man who was a painter. And he was very anxious to obtain uh, a person who would sit before him, or rather, I think the occasion of it was that he saw a lovely baby. And the baby was so impressive to him that he asked for permission to paint the child. And he painted the child, and he painted it as a type of heaven. And then years later, he decided that he would like to paint a picture of a person who might be symbolic of hell fire. And he was in Italy, and he came upon a person who was the ultimate in uh, gruesome ugliness. And he painted the picture. I have up here in my notes somewhere before me, but I can't find it right now. But anyway, he painted this picture... And it was the most uh, gruesome thing he had ever seen in his life. And afterwards, sometime afterwards, he found out that they were actually the same persons. That is, the little infant, so beautiful that he could be actually a type of heaven, a picture of the beauty of heaven in his latter years by virtue of the working of sin in his body. He had ultimately come, become that which might be symbolic of Hades itself. Now we read here, they stand before God and the books were open and another book was open, which is the book of life. A great deal of discussion has taken place over this because the Bible doesn't give us details about some of these things and so we have to make certain inferences. We read here of both books and a book. And so we naturally ask 
the question, well, what are these books? One is said to be the book of life. The other is, or the others are simply said to be books. It has commanded the assent of most Bible teachers to expound this by saying that when we read the books were open, and then another book was opened, the book of life, that it is likely that the books are what we would call the vouchers for the, the book of life. That the book of life contains certain names, but the books contain the acts of the individuals. So that there is a comparison of the book of life with the books which contain the actions. Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse used to explain without a great deal of support, but other than the fact that it seemed to make sense, that we have in the Bible a book said to be the book of life, but we also have in the Bible a book said to be the Lamb's book of life. And he suggested that the book of life, since there is evidence that this was customary for villages and cities to have, a book of life in which were set forth all the citizens that were born in the city, very much like our uh, Bureau of Records, where you go to get your birth certificate, so that everyone who was born in a particular community, his name would be entered in the book of life. But the Lamb's book of life is the book of the elect. And it was Dr. Barnhouse's suggestion that the book of life records the name of every individual born in this universe. And as a person dies, never having believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, his name is erased or blotted out from the book of life. For the Bible speaks of the blotting out of names from the book of life. So that in the final analysis, those left in the book of life will be exactly the ones that are found in the Lamb's book of life, elected before the foundation of the world. Now that makes sense, but there is nothing really in the Bible that would make us think that that's exactly what it has to be. Here we read, books were opened, and the book of life is open. We assume that in one, there are the works by which individuals are going to be judged, and in the other, we have the one book that has to do with their name. So there are two witnesses, one vouchers of the other. By the way, when the books are opened and the book of life is open, the one who is sitting on the throne doesn't do this in order to find out who is in the book of life. He doesn't do it in order to find out what is written in the books. He already knows all of that. This is a symbolic picture. He's not curious. The judge is not sitting there twiddling his thumbs until finally the books are open. And then with great expectation looking down and seeing, well, I wonder who's going to really be in this book. Now, this is the sovereign God. He knows exactly what's in the book. What we are given here is an exposition in order that we might understand it figuratively and have some conception of it. Now we read they were judged according to their works. Twice it's said that they were judged according to their works. At the end of verse 12, according to their works. And then in verse 13, judged every man according to their works. Now there are a couple of things here that I think we should note. One is that this judgment is a just judgment. Paul tells us in Romans that God will judge the secrets of men according to the gospel that he proclaimed. Now, he didn't mean that men were going to be judged by the gospel. He meant his good news was a good news that comprehended a judgment of men. And God would judge the secrets of their hearts, not simply the outward, but the inward as well. All of his thoughts. This is going to be a, a, a most magnificent and interesting scene. Now, I don't want to be there in order to rejoice over the unhappiness of unbelievers, necessarily. But it's going to be certainly a manifestation of the infinite God. They are to be judged justly. Some years ago, I was thinking about this and looked up in uh, the World Book Encyclopedia some facts on light. 
wondering how it is that this judgment would be so just and that the men would actually be judged by, and all of their thoughts even, would uh, be measured by God. You know, when we pull up uh, a shade in a dark room, the light seems to cross the room and reach the opposite wall immediately. Actually, astronomers have known for a long time that it takes time for light to travel from one place to another. According to modern discoveries, the speed of light is the fastest possible speed, or at least that's the speed by which other things are measured. It's a measuring rod in the study of both atoms and the great distances in astronomy. The speed of light was measured by a series of experiments made by Professor Albert Michelson of the University of Chicago. He found that light traveled in a vacuum at 186,284 miles per second. Or if you're interested in the other figure, 299,796 kilometers per second. If the sun were to stop giving light, we would still continue to see it for about eight minutes because it would take 500 seconds for light to travel from the sun to us. On the other hand, if the North Star suddenly exploded, we wouldn't see the explosion for 75 years because it takes that light long for light to travel from that star to us. If we could, so the World Book Encyclopedia said, if we could sit on the star regal with a very powerful telescope focused on the Earth, we would just be able to see Columbus on the shores of America. It takes that long for the light to travel. Now, if that is true, it's certainly not inconceivable that when we, not we, we generally, when man stands before the great white throne judgment, there's not going to be any question about it. Even the brain waves, but all of the actions have created waves, and those waves will actually be seen by the individuals involved. Their mouths will be shut. They will actually see and even hear the things that they have said hundreds of years previously in their lifetime. This judgment is to be absolutely just. If we can even see how it might come to pass naturally, how much more with this eternal God. It's no wonder then that when the Lord Jesus was telling the parable in Luke chapter 16 of the rich man and Lazarus, and he has Abraham say, uh, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, that he says, Son, remember. In other words, they will remember. They will remember everything that they have done. That judgment is going to be just. It will be in accordance with their works. Now some Bible teachers have said we're going to be judged by our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, of course, we shall be judged by that. But we shall be judged by works because a works judgment of unbelievers will ultimately be the same kind of judgment so far as righteousness is concerned. The person who has believed in Jesus Christ will be acquitted by virtue of the things that Christ has accomplished. So he won't have to appear before this. But the fact that a man does not believe will be evidenced by his life. That's what our Lord says now. It is evidenced by their lives. So they are judged according to their works. The judgment is really ultimately the same because a man's faith is seen in his works. Or it is not seen in his works. This judgment is in degrees. The Bible does tell us that there are some that shall suffer more than others. The Lord Jesus speaks of that in Matthew chapter 11, when he speaks about how the judgment shall be greater for some cities than others. Let me remind you of those verses in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 or so. Then began he to upbraid the cities in which most of the mighty works of his were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, 
and sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sodom at the day of judgment than for you. Need look at the other passages, but that establishes the fact that judgment is in degrees. Now we read in verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. No one is excluded. The consequences of the judgment are described in verses 14 and 15. He says, And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now you'll remember that in the Garden of Eden, when man sinned, God pronounced judgment upon Adam, upon Eve, and upon the serpent. The judgment for the failure to keep the covenant, he broke the covenant, ate of that fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, is death, according to the Bible. Spiritual death. The spiritual death manifested itself in physical death. Dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return now, since you've sinned, Adam. And if a man is not delivered from that spiritual death, which issues in physical death, then his spiritual death is prolonged into eternity. So that we often say that there are three kinds of death, spiritual, physical, eternal. But really, there is only one penalty, it is death. It manifests itself in physical death, prolonged, it is eternal death. Well, first of all, he speaks then of the abolition of death and Hades, and then the initiation of the second death. Verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Sin involves endless guilt. Time does not convert sin into innocence. We tend to think that. We think because we sinned 20 years ago, well, 20 years wipes out a lot of things, and so time has covered our guilt. No, no. A sin committed 20 years ago is just as much an offense against the holy God today as it was when you committed it 20 years ago. Time does not change sin into innocence. The idea, I say, of guilty for 10 days or guilty for 30 days or guilty for a year or 10 years, that's human justice. That's not divine, that's Hibernian. The Bible speaks of the fact of eternal just judgment because the person against whom we saw sin is an infinite God. And you are just as guilty now as you were when you committed that sin 25, 35 years ago, if it is not covered by the blood of Christ. There is a magnificent uh, statement by a preacher an older preacher who speaks about judgment, and I'd like to read it because I think it's really a, a, a magnificent thing. He says, The eternal punishment of the wicked, the eternal happiness of the righteous, and the eternity of God, as far as revelation is concerned, form the same building. The universalist has placed his shoulders against the basement pillars, and if he succeeds, the whole structure falls. But he and his co-laborers may toil and sweat, and leave their bones to molder away in the cellars. But God lives on. The righteous shout on, he means in joy, and the damned groan on throughout all eternity. All eternity. God is an infinite God, and the sin against him is infinite sin, and it's not lessened in any way by the passage of time. That's why... Punishment must be eternal punishment. And furthermore, the more a person suffers punishment, the more opposed and rebellious to the word of God he becomes throughout the ages of eternity. So 1,000 years after he has been in the lake of fire, he will be more rebellious against God than he was when he began his period of time in the lake of fire. Thus, the Bible speaks of human sin. The reality and horror of the second death 
The Bible speaks of so plainly. Listen to the terrors of the wicked. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. And, but the righteous into life eternal. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members perish, and not that thy whole body be cast into hell. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? L. R. Scarborough was a well-known Baptist preacher. A man came to him once in one of the churches in which he was pastor and wanted to join the church. He said, I'm thinking of joining your church and I have a question to ask you. Do you believe it's necessary in order for a man to be a Baptist to believe in the doctrine of hell? Well, said the preacher, let's see, maybe your trouble is more serious than that. Do you believe in heaven? The man said, oh yes, I firmly believe in heaven. Uh, you buried my mother not long ago and you also buried my son some time back. And I believe that both are in heaven. And you do not believe in hell, Dr. Scarborough said. He said, no, I don't believe in hell. I believe hell is an injustice. It's dishonoring to God. And I don't believe a merciful God would allow there to be a place of eternal punishment. Well, Dr. Scarborough said, on whose authority do you believe in heaven? Well, on the authority of the Lord Jesus. On the authority of the Bible. He said, on whose authority in the Bible? He said, on the authority of the Lord Jesus, as set forth in the Bible. Well, said Dr. Scarborough, on the authority of Christ you believe in heaven. Now, suppose I quote from Jesus Christ just as plain a statement regarding hell. Do you believe that Christ will tell you the truth about heaven, and he'll not tell you the truth about hell? Oh, said the man, you put it that way. Yes, I do. Jesus Christ, Dr. Scarborough says, speaks many more times about eternal punishment than he does about heaven. And then he added, my friend, if you don't believe in the doctrine of hell, you don't believe that Jesus Christ is a reliable authority about anything. That's true. That is true. There is no need to talk about the Bible and about Christ if we don't believe in the judgment of the wicked dead. It is the Lord Jesus. Into whose hands God has given. More than any other New Testament character. The preaching of the doctrine of hell. There is a way of escape. Hell lies at the end of a Christless life. The way of escape is the belief. In a redeemer. Who has offered a sacrifice. For sinners. You may come, receive as a free gift everlasting life by virtue of the blood that was shed and have the assurance that you'll never appear before the great white throne judgment. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful to thee for these wonderful passages from the Bible which warn us and admonish us concerning righteousness and justice. We do look forward to the day when there is equity in the earth. O oh God, help us to pluck brands from the burning in the meantime, by thy grace, through the Holy Spirit and the word, for Jesus' sake. Amen.